it's with folks doing in today from across the state and even further away. So when we do this workshop in person, we usually spend most of the time outside looking at birds. So I encourage you that if it's safe for you to do so, to take what you learned today and head outside to practice looking at birds or head to uh, your backyard. So uh, as all of y'all might know, um, this program is free. And so we realize times are tough for many people, but we really appreciate any donations that you're able to give. Your support goes directly to our nonprofit education programs and allows us to provide programming and materials to students across Santa Fe. And we'll drop a link to the donation page in the chat box if you're interested. And so now um, that, that's all been set up, I'll let Katie Weeks, who is our Director of Community Education, take it away. Thanks, Katie. All right, hi everybody. Happy Friday. Um, I'm really excited to be presenting. My name again is Katie Weeks. I'm the Director of Community Education with Audubon, New Mexico, and I work out of the Randall Davy Audubon Center in Santa Fe. Um, just so everyone knows, this is being recorded and is being streamed on Facebook, and we're also going to be posting this on YouTube um, at the end. I would also encourage you, we're going to do a little bit of an activity um, in a little bit, so if you've got a pencil and paper, that might be fun. And also, it's a really good way to engage and make sure you're like learning, actively learning, while we go through a ton of different birds today um, and learn a lot of different skills. I also really wanted to take a moment um, and acknowledge that the current situation that's happening across the country. Audubon, New Mexico stands in solidarity with Black communities against centuries of systemic racism, violence, and oppression. We disavow all forms of racism and prejudice and are committed to supporting equity and diversity and conservation and across our society. We know that Black and other communities of color carry this weight and trauma disproportionately, and it's been a really challenging week for everybody, but especially for them. Everyone deserves access and safety to the outdoors, um, and especially to the joy and the healing properties of bird watching. So I encourage you all to check out some resources that have been posted all over the internet this week um, to help support a more just and equitable community, and also to celebrate some exciting things like Black Birders Week that's been happening all week. Um, it's really fun, you can look it up, and it's wrapping up today. So let's get started. This is beginning birding the backyard birds of Santa Fe. And just to go over a little bit of what we're doing today, our goals are to improve the birding skills of you guys, of all of our participants out there, to familiarize ourselves with some common species that we find around Santa Fe in northern New Mexico, a little bit more broadly, and then also give us some tools and some different ways to promote bird-friendly communities, um, both at home in your backyard and in other places we might see. So today we're gonna go over with a quick introduction about bird watching and some skills and tools that we might use. Why do, why do we like bird watching? Some tools, um, and then go do, get really birdie and get into some of those backyard birds um, that we've got around. I'm gonna make this caveat that we cannot cover all the birds of New Mexico today. So that is not the purpose of this webinar. There are over 550 different species that have been spotted, that have been cited in New Mexico and 373 species in Santa Fe County alone. So if we were to focus on every single bird, we'd be here forever <laughs> and that's just not really feasible. So today, this webinar is really focused um, on providing you with the basics to help you get started on your bird watching journey um, and check out some of the cool birds you might be seeing around our backyards right now. All right, and this um, awesome little picture right here um, is one of my favorite birds that we have in Santa Fe. You might recognize them as a rufous hummingbird. Um, they're not quite here, and we'll talk about them later, but um, yeah, definitely a, a crowd favorite, I think. All right, so. Just really quick, um, Audubon, New Mexico is part of a national network. You can see here we are located across the country in state offices, nature centers like the Randall Davy Audubon Center. We've got chapters, we've got um, field offices and groups, and we all work together in this network really to conserve birds in their habitat 
um, for the benefit of wildlife and for people who live around them. So you can see us, the little uh, blue and green dots there in New Mexico, we are both Audubon New Mexico as a state office, as well as a nature center, as well as a chapter. So we get to be part of the kind of this cool big birding party across the country. We do a lot of different things. You might think of us just as bird watchers, as bird watching clubs, but we're actually one of the leading nonprofit conservation organizations in the state and across the country. Um, we use science-based approaches to drive our conservation. We focus on lots of different habitats since birds are everywhere, freshwater, grasslands, forests, and of course, climate, because that impacts, overlaps all of those. We have a strong focus on outreach and education, which is my job and my favorite part of my job. And we also do engage with policymakers and lawmakers. Um, if you want to come visit us once things are a little bit safer and opened up, you can find us at the Randall Davy Audubon Center, which is at the very end of Canyon Road in Santa Fe. Um, and we've got trails and camps and programs and sorts of things, but we're not quite open yet. <laughs> um, and we also, that's also one of our state offices. We have a second one in Albuquerque and staff spread across the state. So why do we, why birding? Like why, why are people into this, this hobby? In the last couple of months, we've seen a real increase in the number of people who are really getting into backyard bird watching since a lot of us are home a lot more than we usually are. We finally have a chance to slow down and notice the wildlife that's actually right outside our door and our window. Personally, I've been building a lot of texts from my friends and family of, what's this bird? This thing's on my balcony. What is this? So there's definitely been an increase in the last few months. So we have a lot of brand new birders who are out in our community and joining our ranks and it's awesome. And we all have a lot of different reasons to get into bird watching. My big reason is because birds are pretty cool. <laughs> you know, they're, uh, they come in all sorts of shapes, colors, sizes. They live in almost every continent um, across the country, in every single habitat. You know, we've got them all over the place and they all, I think, are just amazing. You can see even just from just this picture, the diversity of plumage, their beak shapes, their sizes. Um, and I just find birds fascinating. People find them poetic and beautiful and inspiring. Um, and I just think birds are cool. And the more I learn, the more I think they're even more awesome. A lot of people also like birding because they're really great bioindicators. The reason why we use birds as a method of conservation is because they're a really, they're literally the canaries in the coal mine um, for a lot of ecosystem health. So, you know, we can think about if we conserve just one species of bird, you're probably also conserving the plants they rely on, the water they need, which brings all the different species up. And it's probably also good for the people who live around there. So you might notice in this picture, this is one of our also uh, state favorites. These are the beautiful sandhill cranes who come in winter in New Mexico every year. We have some of the largest populations of wintering sandhill cranes in the country, um, all along the Rio, especially a little bit south of Albuquerque and the Bosque del Apache. It's got the International Crane Festival every year. So these are, sandhill cranes are also definitely one of my favorite birds that we've got here in the state. Probably not your backyard bird though, especially not in Santa Fe. And like I was saying, you know, we can use birding as both like a personal thing. We really enjoy getting joy out of that, but it's also can be really helpful to our scientific community. Um, a lot of birders can, uh, participate in something called eBird. So that little picture up in the left, um, top left corner, that is a worldwide database that birders upload their site, um, all the birds they're seeing uh, every day. And it has this huge amount of information um, that's used by scientists. A lot of birders participate in annual um, monitoring programs, things like Climate Watch, which is sponsored by Audubon. Usually happens in the winter and the summer. This year, our summer one is on hold, but um, they're great ways to use your birding for good, essentially, and to really impact um, our scientific knowledge of birds, their migratory patterns, 
um, in populations. And all of this information gets aggregated and used by real scientists. So um, just last October, Audubon released its survival by degrees report, which was the most recent climate report. Um, wasn't very hopeful, to be totally honest. You know, we reported based on all the information coming out of eBird and other academic sources that there's over 300, about 389 species of birds in North America who are climate threatened. Um, and that can be a little bit of a, of a downer, you know, but um, really contributing and helping is going to make it, it's even more important than ever that we are monitoring birds and taking notice of them, especially as we're in this era of change and, um, and a climate crisis. So in addition to that sort of downer, but birding can also just be really fun. It engages different parts of your brain, it can be very analytical, you know, you're looking at different things, you're learning, but it, you're also, it's also very visual, you're looking at colors, sometimes it can be very emotional for folks. Um, so it's really, I think, a full body, full brain um, experience. So in order to do that, we're gonna do a little bit of an activity now. I've never done this on webinar, so we're gonna see how it goes. We're gonna do a little bit of a brain exercise. So normally when we're looking at birds out in the real world, you have all of those analytical things that are happening in your brain are happening really fast. You're saying size, color, da da, all of that is happening really, really fast. But what I want us to do in this activity is to slow that process down and really start training our brain to think about each of those different parts in distinct um, categories. So grab a writing utensil, maybe a pencil, a marker, crayon, if that's what's around you, um, piece of paper, scratch paper or something. I'm gonna show you a picture of a, sil a silhouette of a bird and I want you to sketch it. It doesn't have to be a masterpiece. No one's gonna see it, especially because we're on a webinar. You know, we're not even in a classroom setting together. Um, but what I really want you to look at is focus on the shape of the body and also the shape of the beak. So those are two places that you're really gonna wanna spend some time analyzing and looking at it, okay? I'm gonna show you the picture, the silhouette, and give you about 30 seconds to, to sketch something out. You ready? All right, so go ahead, draw this bird. Remember to, to keep, to think about the body shape, that beak shape, what does the overall shape look like, but also some of the more subtle details in there. And this is a process that would normally happen very quickly, you know, instantaneously in our brain, but because I'm making you use paper and pencil, it's gonna go a little bit, a little bit slower. All right, I'm gonna start talking again since I can't see if you're ready or you're done, but um, I want, you can hold up, show your picture to somebody else in your house, or if you wanna tag us on social media, I'd love to see your masterpieces. Um, it's always fun to see what people what people come up with. So this bird, I'm gonna take away the silhouette so you can kind of see what it actually looks like. All right, so this is the actual bird without the silhouette shadow box on top of it. And what's the first thing we notice? It's really blue. And if I hadn't had that silhouette on top of it, you'd probably just zero in on that, that brilliant blue color. But there's a couple of different bluebirds that we have in Santa Fe. So focusing on things like the shape and the beak shape are really good ways for us to be able to distinguish all the different bluebirds from each other. So let's take a closer look. First, I want us to check out that beak. But I would describe that beak as, you know, a little bit longer. It's kind of in the middle, medium, thick-ish, a little bit rounded. It's not like long and skinny. It's not super sharp, kind of like a generalist beak is what I might call it. As you can tell, I have very technical terminology for all of my birds. Next, I want us to look, you might have noticed, maybe not, 
This bird has a little bit of a flatter skull. So it's not really round or anything. It's a little bit flatter, but that you may not have noticed that. That's okay. But the last thing that I think you probably did notice is it's got a really long tail. It's got a tail that's almost half of its body length, very distinct, um, and that's a pretty good indicator of something to look at. So we've got all these things together in our brain. We're analyzing them. You might know what this bird is. You might not. We're going to come back to it in a little bit. I'm not going to tell you what it is yet um, since I've got it on another slide, but they are definitely some of our backyard birds. But what we're starting to think about is looking at the whole bird in different parts of it, not just focusing on one aspect. So as you start to practice this, you know, training your brain, really developing your observational muscles, um, you're going to start learning a lot about the world around you. You might notice, like with the photo on the left, some behaviors of birds, what they're doing, where they are in their habitat. You might notice the differences between habitats, like that picture on the right version of like an open prairie or a savanna versus something scrubbier versus like a full forest woodland. And as you also do this, you'll probably start noticing some of the different wildlife we have around, which I think is just a joy. The more you notice, the more you can connect um, with the natural world around you, which I just think is probably one of the best things we've got going right now. All right, so this is just a really quick slide since we've got some new beginner birders, some different tools that you might need or use. Um, some people use binoculars. I've got mine kind of right next to my desk so that way I can procrastinate anytime I'm sending emails. Um, I am not a binocular expert, um, but I'm gonna have Amy drop a, a link in the chat if you are interested in learning more about binoculars. Audubon has a really good binocular guide. There's some different standards and sizes and you know you can go down the rabbit hole with that one. So I will let you choose your own adventure with that. Um, the other thing, but one of the things I'll note that is that binoculars are a great tool for you to use. They really help you get good views of birds, but nothing can replace you just using your eyes and just training your eyes. Binoculars can be a little bit of a curve to learn about and get used to using them because they're kind of hard, especially when I teach kids how to use them. So just use your eyes and just practice with your eyeballs is what I always tell the kids. Um, so another thing, just like what we just practiced, do um, actually using your hands, doing journaling, taking notes, sketching, it's a really good way, again, to slow down your brain um, and engage that learning process. I'm a millennial, so I also like using technology. Um, I like using apps a lot. They're really helpful for me. I don't carry a lot of like my field guides and things out in the in the field. Um, there's also a lot of different books and field guides you can use. Everyone's got some different preferences. Some really good apps to use. Um, Audubon has a free field guide app that you can check out birds in your area. It'll even tell you if you type in like some of the colors and shapes and sizes, it'll give you some ideas. Um, and I also really love Merlin Bird ID, which is that picture on the right that comes out of Cornell. I think it's a really fabulous beginner birder app and it helps, again, train your brain. And then the last tool that I will just say is that practice, practice, practice. Nothing replaces practicing. Um, you know, we as adults don't often practice new skills. We would expect a kid to practice the piano every day if they're trying to learn a new song. But as adults, we don't learn new things very often. So go outside five minutes a day, even in a parking lot or your backyard. Um, and the more you practice these observation skills, the easier it'll get and the birds will become more familiar. All right, so you may not have known, but we've already gone over a couple of birding tips so far, thinking about color, but also as we go through the birds, and I'm gonna start showing you in the next slide, I want you to think about maybe patterns that you see on their body, not just is it blue, is it not blue, where is the blue? I want you to think about their overall body shape, like what we're looking at with that silhouetted bird. Um, relative size is a little bit hard on a screen, but I'll try to mention them as we go. And also behavior is something to think about. Um, and like I said, practice, practice, practice. It's my other number one tip for birders. All right, so here's our very first birds, some common backyard birds that we've got in um, Santa Fe, normally in a classroom setting, 
I would be talking to you and asking you questions and things, but you can, I guess, type it in the chat if you want to tell Amy what you think these birds are, um, or you can just yell at your screen or tell somebody else in your house, kind of like Dora the Explorer. Um, but these are two of our most common birds that you might see around. They are, are, they are related to each other. Um, you might see some, some similarities and some of their markings on there. So I'm going to give you a second to look at that, those photos. But the other thing I wanted to point out is that both of these birds or both of these photos feature water features in them. So if you're looking for ways to attract more birds to your backyard or to support them, um, you know, in New Mexico, water is life. Fresh water is what helps wildlife survive. So really, if you put water out, especially if you've got it moving, making some sounds with like maybe a little fountain or something, um, you will get birds and it'll help support them and other wildlife around you. So just a little plug for a bird friendly community right there. And maybe you've figured out by now that who these two species are. These are, this is our American Robin on the left, one of the most common birds that we've got across the US. Um, they're literally the early birds, you know, they're the ones pulling up the, the worms. They're some of the first ones to sing in the spring. They are very early nesters. Um, you'll, they've got that gray back, kind of a, a reddish belly um, and a yellow beak. And you might hear them singing their little song in my mnemonic, my like cue that I use. So they sound like chirrup, 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 chirrup. So you'll hear them singing all day, every day, everywhere you go probably, <laughs> once you start recognizing it. They are related, in fact, to our Western bluebirds, who I think are just wonderful little birds. Um, if you see one, either the male or the female, you'll probably see the other one. Um, they are often in family groups. They are great um, nest boxer, nest box users. So if you put out, if you live somewhere that's got kind of an open field space, um, some trees nearby or some fence posts, they love that habitat. So go ahead, put up some um, bluebird nest boxes. It might take them a little bit to find it, even a few years. Birds like aren't looking for homes all the time, but they will, if they find it, they will start to use them. Um, and they're really wonderful to have as nest boxes. Um, and you can see they're little, they might look a little bit different from the robins, but they are similar. Some things we look for are those eye rings. Um, and if you see their silhouette, especially maybe on that male in the middle, he's got a little bit of a belly. So both of these thrushes do have, I would not call them slender birds. You know, they've got a little bit of a belly. So it makes their silhouette, again, somewhat distinct. All right. So moving on. You may recognize some of these friendly, curious little birds. We have both of these species here in Santa Fe, um, but they can be very tricky to distinguish from one another. So take a second, when you look at those two, see if you can identify some field marks you might use. These are both species of chickadees. One is more common in the east, one is more common in the west, and in Santa Fe we have both. So, We've got a mountain chickadee on the left and a black capped chickadee on the right. Um, and there's a couple of key things we look for to distinguish these two little birds from one another. Um, where my biggest thing that I always look for is that little eyebrow on the mountain chickadee. Really distinct, really easy to see. Whereas a black capped chickadee has a black cap covering its entire skull. So that, for me, that's one of the easiest ways to tell them apart. Some people also talk about, you know, the buffy sides of, you know, the mountain chickadee versus the black capped chickadee. But for, to be honest, these birds are usually moving so quickly, <laughs> you know, around trees and in feeders that I never have time to look for that anyway. But um, the other really good thing that I use to distinguish them is actually my ears. So we're going to try to play. I've got kind of a elaborate setup here, some calls so you can hear. And I want, I'm going to start with the mountain chickadee. And what I want, it usually, they both, both of these species kind of say the chickadee dee dee mnemonic that many people were taught when they were kids. But the mountain chickadee is very buzzy. It's got a buzzy quality. So I want you to listen for that. Battery, if you listen. Oh, All right. So got that pattern. 
shiggity dee dee, but really buzzy. And then we're going to listen to the black cap chickadee. So if you're from the East Coast, this might be like a very familiar nostalgic sound for you to hear. Still has that pattern, chickadee dee 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 dee, but much smoother. All right. So we're gonna keep moving on to some other unique birds that we've got going on. These birds don't look anything alike. I admit that right now. But the thing I want us to look at is that they have these really distinct beaks. And those beaks tell you a lot about their behavior and their life story or their life history. So you might see both of these guys come visit your backyard. Um, if you've got some trees, maybe some plants going around. And so the guy on the left is a curved bill thrasher. This bird is about the size of a robin, all brown, got these very distinct orange eyes if you get close enough, but really looking at that curved bill that it gets its name from, right? Um, it does have like a very long and beautiful song that I'll let you guys look up later. Um, and they love to nest in cholla cactuses. So it's a great reason to plant some of our cactuses in your yard if you've got them. But they use that big thick beak almost like a hoe to like dig up the soil and the insects that are um, that you would find in your backyard. Similarly, you see this little guy on the right. In real life, these birds are not the same size. It's just the size of the picture. Um, nuthatches are much smaller birds, but they, you can notice they have this very sharp, long beak. And that, again, tells us a little bit about their behavior. They like woodpeckers will crawl up and down the side of a tree looking for insects and using that beak to really get underneath bark and things like that. We have a few other different species of nut hatches around Santa Fe, but this is the most common one. Um, they're a little bit bigger than the other species we've got. Got a very white chest and belly. Um, I think they're really cute. They, but the thing that really, um, makes them notable to me is that they have this super distinct behavior is that they're always, crawling down trees. With our kids, our students who come up to the Davies Center, we tell them this is the Spider-Man bird because he's always crawling upside down, going down the trunk of a tree looking for insects. And the kids are always listening to see if they can hear it laughing at them. So we're gonna take a listen to sort of this like <laughs> dorky kind of sounding laugh sound. So I like these guys, they're really cute. Um, and you will see them around lots of different trees you've got. All right, so moving on through our birds, um, some other really common birds that you might have around your house or your neighborhood. Um, we've got two different species of towhees, canyon towhee on the left, spotted towhee in the middle, um, and then house finches, which are again, a super common bird we have across North America. Um, so starting with the canyon towhee, these are little gray guys. They have a little bit of a brown head, um, a little bit of a red butt, as I kind of described to kids. Um, under the rufous under the tail is the bird or phrase we would use. <laughs> but, um, and sometimes you can see a little bit of a black spot in their chest. Um, or if you're from California, they have California towhees out there and they look virtually identical. Um, I always see these, they're very cute and curious and I always see them in parking lots, actually like hopping under my car and on top of my car and things like that. Spotted towhees are also um, really cute and curious birds that we've got around here. Um, some people think they're orioles because they have similar colorations, um, but they've got kind of these black spots on the back or white spots on black on their back, uh, rufous red sides and a white chest. Um, you often see them scratching. So you might notice they have really long claws. So in Spanish, their name is rascador, which is someone who scratches. Um, and that's a very distinct behavior for them. And their mnemonic is drink your tea. So if you hear them out singing, you'll hear that kind of pattern, the tea, tea, tea. And they will sing that all day, every day. The males, especially this time of year, are just blasting it. 
And then the last guys we've got on this page are our house finches, super common. The males can range from red, as you can see on the right, um, to sometimes an orange, depending on the community where you live. And females are a much more drab brown color, um, but they both have kind of this brown um, spotted stre uh, streaked breast is what we would call it. And their sounds are probably some of the, I think of them almost like white noise bird calls. So we're gonna listen to them for just a second. Probably hear this all the time. So again, a really common sound that you'll just hear in your backyard, downtown Santa Fe, these birds are everywhere. And once you start to recognize them, you can pick them out from other birds who are making different sounds. All right, so moving on, this, these guys are definitely different and they don't look anything alike, but I put them on this slide together for a reason. They're very common birds that we have in urban areas. Um, what do they have in common? You might know, you might be saying it to your computer or typing it in the chat. I can see that is lighting up right now. Um, but these are two common birds that we have that are very invasive species um, across North America. They are both introduced by, from Europe. So we've got on the left, a Eurasian collared dove. We might see flapping around everywhere. On the right, are co super common house sparrows. They're also sometimes known as English sparrows. Um, so starting with the Eurasian collared dove on the left, you can probably tell where it gets its name. It's got a collar on its neck. They're a little bit larger than our native doves that we've got. Um, and they, there's some uh, data to show that they might be displacing our native doves, which makes us a little bit concerned um, just thinking about the native species that we have here and wanting to preserve those. The other birds on the right are our house sparrows. When I was a kid, I used to call these McDonald's birds because, um, or French fries birds, because I always saw them in the McDonald's parking lot stealing French fries from people. So they're in pretty much any urban setting you've got in North America. They were purposefully introduced um, by a group of Shakespeare enthusiasts who really wanted to um, have all of the birds mentioned in Shakespeare's plays in like New York City and unfortunately they just didn't know the, the long-term impacts of that. So now we've got these sparrows everywhere. Um, they are again probably out competing some of our native sparrows which is a little bit unfortunate um, but it is good to be able to identify them. The males have those black faces and the females are a little bit darker brown than the house finches than the native house finches that we have. And I did mention that we have native doves. We have two around um, Santa Fe that are really great to have. We've got a morning dove on the left, a white winged dove for Stevie Nicks on the right. Um, and you'll, you've probably seen them around. They make really loud noises. My big thing to mention is that these guys are not owls. Um, a lot of people think they have owls singing in the morning um, and they do not, they have doves outside their window. So we're gonna take a listen to it just for a second. Does sound hooty, not an owl. They're doves. So, um, I think doves are pretty, they're pretty cool. All right, we're gonna keep moving. We're at 4.35, we got a lot of birds to get through. All right, so one of the most common birding questions that we get is how do you tell the difference between a raven and a crow? These are two black corvids. Corvids are this group of uh, family of birds that we have here. How do you tell them apart? You can yell at your screen, put it in the chat if you want. Here's my tips of how to tell them apart. So we're looking at a couple of very distinct field marks. On the left, we've got our crow. They're a little bit smaller in size. You see them next to each other. If you're out wandering around, you'll definitely be able to distinguish. Ravens, big, big birds. Crows, much smaller birds. Um, if, and with the size comes also the size of their beak. 
ravens have big honking beaks. You can kind of see it um, in that picture. They're very thick, whereas crows are a little bit longer and skinnier, a little bit more dainty. Um, crows have a little bit more slender head. They've got um, smoother shoulders is kind of how I think of it. They kind of just stick out, whereas ravens have very large heads. They have sort of like these feathery beardy things going on. Um, and they've got, they're not really shoulders, but they look like shoulders. You can kind of see that bump in that picture right there, um, just because they're much larger birds. The other big cue is to look at their tails. Whereas uh, crows have a fan shaped tail, or it looks like a C, C for crow is my, my little tip. Whereas ravens have wedges. So you can see in that photo, you know, it's not a perfect fan. It's got a little bump in the middle. Um, and that wedge shape is what helps distinguish the two if you just see them kind of soaring from afar. The last thing I will say is that they've got really different sounds. So crows, they caw. Like every scary mo movie soundtrack, right? Cro climb crows. Whereas ravens are bigger, so they have much lower voices you know, maybe an octave lower, I guess. Very croaky. So thinking about crow's caw, whereas ravens are very croaky. I will also say that ravens make tons of different sounds. So if I'm ever out hiking and I hear a sound that I can't figure it out, there's a really good chance that it's a raven. They're like clicking and they purr and they make all sorts of different vocalizations. So this is just one tip to help distinguish them from one another. And I mentioned that crows and ravens are part of a group called corvids, which are um, include jays, magpies. Um, these are three blue birds that we've got in Santa Fe. They're all jays, but they're not blue jays. We've got Stellar's jay, Woodhouse scrub jay, which was our bird in the middle, or from the silhouette and pinion jays. So all of these guys live around Santa Fe. Stellar's jays have those great mohawks. They've got a little bit of a white eyebrow. Um, they're really funny. I love them. I think they're beautiful. They're very brilliant blue. Woodhouse scrub jays, on the other hand, in the middle, are a little bit not as brilliant blue, but they've got kind of a lighter chest. Um, they, and again, a little bit of a different size beak. If you see them next to each other, they look pretty different. And then our last one is the pinion jay, who is a species of concern for us. They're really um, not doing so well with a lot of climate change and deforestation. So um, they're a species that Audubon New Mexico thinks about a lot. They're in social groups. They make um, a lot of different noise. You can hear them coming from across the canyon. And you can see they're a little bit of a different color blue and a little bit of a longer beak. So this is a bird that we think and care about a lot. So I'm going to keep moving. So two other birds who we think about with what we call pinion juniper woodlands, which is kind of all of that foresty stuff up around the Sangre de Cristos um, that's got all the pinion pines and the juniper trees. Um, these two birds are, are obligate species, so they are reliant on those habitats to survive. They've co-evolved with those. So we've got a Townsend solitaire on the left. Um, again, this is another thrush that we have related to the bluebirds and the um, robins. They've got that white eye ring. Um, we see them a little bit more in the winter and fall. So right now they're probably a little higher elevation. And this cute little guy on the right is one of my favorite little birds. He's called a juniper titmouse. He's got a little bit of a little um, mohawk on the top, but he's otherwise pretty gray, but these are very little. They're about the size of a chickadee. Um, these guys might be really hard for you to see. They're really secretive and they move really fast, but again, they are heavily reliant on pinyon juniper forest. So if you have the ability to keep, to plant pinyon pine or keep up old snags, dead trees, um, you know, these guys are really reliant on those. We've also started noticing that they use bluebird boxes so if you live in a pinyon juniper woodland and you think you have juniper titmice, you can try putting up some bluebird boxes and see if they will use it to nest because they're having a hard time because they're losing a lot of their um, nesting cavities right now. All right, I'm gonna keep going. 
All right, so some other birds that you may have been seeing in your yard a little bit less right now. Um, we, I consider this 201, 301 birding. We call, and the IBBB is a birding joke. Huh? It's called uh, itty bitty brown birds, which is just shorthand for, I don't know what that little floof is. But, um, so these are some little gray floofs is my technical term for these guys, but their real name is called a dark-eyed junco. We have four species around New Mexico. Um, and these are definitely winter migrants for us. But what I want us to focus on with these pictures is that all four of these are the same species. They all look very different. Again, their coloration might look different, but if you look at their beak shape, their overall body shape, you'll notice they're all consistent. So again, that's another advocate for looking at more than just coloration when you're looking at birds. Um, these guys are little sparrows. You'll see them hopping around in the ground in the winter. Right now they've moved a little bit higher in elevation, probably up towards um, their submarine grounds, but they're definitely some of my favorite uh, winter migrants that we get. On the opposite end of the spectrum from the little gray flutes, we've got some big birds that live around here too. So a summer migrant for us is our turkey vulture. Um, you'll see them soaring all day out wherever you are. Um, they're really awesome. They're really important scavengers, parts of the ecosystem. What I look for when I see them is that they have really, really long, long wings. Um, they have kind of a distinct uh, silhouette when you're looking at them. And they've got, you can notice the bottom part of their wings is all white and the kind of shoulder area is a little bit blacker. Uh, you might also see as soaring out just kind of as you're driving around is some red-tailed hawks. These guys are big hawks that we've got. They sit on light posts everywhere. They have a very distinct red tail, brownish red tail. Um, but the other thing you can look for that it's kind of pointed out with these arrows is, again, those little bit of um, gray along the shoulder area. They're not really shoulders. And also birders look for a belly band. So you can see that they've got some kind of speckling right around their middle side. A fun thing to think about with these guys is that um, they, they were, they've been misidentified as eagles in movies. I'm gonna play the sound of a red-tailed hawk and it is not an eagle. Hollywood is lying to you. I'm so sorry if I ruined all your movies, but every time you see a bald eagle come up on a screen and they play that sound, it's not, it's not an eagle. Tilt off. All right, so moving right along, we've got another group of birds, our woodpeckers, and this is a 201, uh, maybe 301 for some of us, two common woodpeckers that look very similar. We've got hairy woodpeckers and downy woodpeckers. So hairies are a little bit bigger, downies are a little bit smaller. My mnemonic is dainty downies, huge hairies. They're very different sizes. The other thing to look at is the size of their beaks. Um, hairy woodpeckers, their uh, beaks are about the same size as their skull, whereas downy woodpeckers are very, very short. So if you push their um, beaks back into their skull, it would disappear entirely, whereas the hairy would still stick out if you pushed it in. And to help us a little bit with the um, size, this is a really great picture that I got off of the New Mexico Birders Facebook group, who's a great resource for new birders. Um, but Tina Schmidt took this awesome picture and you can really see that downies are small, hairies are big. And it's very evident um, when you see them side by side. You don't always get to see that, but um, that's the number one way to identify them because otherwise their coloration and their marking is very, very similar. Another really cool woodpecker that we have around here doesn't look anything like those two birds. And that's the northern flicker. We've got the male on the right, the female on the left. Um, you might see these on your feeders or maybe in your yard. Um, and this, in New Mexico, we have the red shafted variety. In the east, you might have a yellow shafted. But here we have a red shafted and you can really see it as they're flying in this great picture um, in a picture of their feathers. It's really the center part of their feather is actually bright orange. Some of my favorite feathers that we've got around here. 
So we're getting through some of our birds. Right now we've got a lot of little so yellow summer birds, as I call them. Um, you might, if you have thistle feeders, which is that type of feeder in that center picture right there, you might see all three of these right now. These guys are all common um, through the spring and summer. And these are our goldfinches, a lesser goldfinch on the left, American goldfinch in the middle. And then we also have pine siskins who often get confused for these guys. So, um, you know, lesser goldfinches are a little bit more lemony colors, how I describe them. Um, the female is underneath, the male is on top. And we, their call I can hear in the, is kind of a descending whistle. So it's, Ew! I don't have a recording of it, but if you go outside or listen to a recording, it's definitely got that just like very simple kind of descending. Uh, the beautiful American goldfinch in the middle, we distinguish them because they're kind of like this very bright yellow gold color, um, but they have black wings with white wing bars. So you can really see that in that center picture with the female. As compared to the pine siskins who are on the right, who some people think are goldfinches, but they just look like really dirty for some reason. They're, it's because they're different, a different species that's pretty common um, for us in northern New Mexico. Uh, they've got a lot more speckling on their breast and just a little bit of yellow. Um, and they have a really fun call that I think sounds like a zipper. So we call them the zipper birds when we teach um, some of our students. So we'll take a second and listen to those. And you hear the zipper going zoop. So those are kind of fun, fun little birds. I like seeing them around. They also have a much skinnier beak than our um, goldfinches. All right, so this is our last group of birds that we're gonna go through before we do um, questions. And it's our crowd favorite, it's the hummingbirds. Um, they're beautiful, everyone loves them. They're little gems. In New Mexico, we have four different species. In the spring and right now, we only have the two on the left. So we've got broad tails and black chins. So those two birds on the left. And around 4th of July, late summer, we're going to start getting uh, calliopes, who are a little bit smaller, kind of shyer birds, and the rufous hummingbirds, who are definitely the jerks of the bird feeders. They're super aggressive and bright orange, and everyone notices them, and they don't share, and they don't play well. <laughs> so um, right now, you know, we've got, again, those two species, but as we pick up in the next couple of weeks, we'll probably start seeing all four of those if you've got feeders out around your yard. And these are fabulous pictures all taken by our volunteer, Tom Taylor, who's one of our um, docents at the Randall Davy Audubon Center. I will say that all of those pictures were male hummingbirds. So females are really hard to tell apart in juveniles. They all kind of look like the female on the left. They're green, varying degrees of brown rufous on their sidings. They have some different tails, um, but it's definitely like a 301, 401 birding, which we don't have time to go into today. But the males are really easy to pick out. They've got broad tails, have this bright kind of fuchsia color gorget on their chin, and you can hear them. You probably hear them outside right now. They are just buzzing everywhere as they fly. It's the, um, you know, they're trying to get females' attention. Um, they do really crazy displays where the fly around and swoop and they also just like to sit out in the best perch in the sun um, and make sure they get the best light to, so that they shine as brightly as they can. So that's, you know, males trying to look good like always. A lot of people ask how can we get more hummingbirds to our yard and one of the best things you can do for birds when the like, number one at home conservation tip is plant native plants. Um, they're adapted for our environment out here. We don't have a lot of water. We shouldn't be planting exotic plants that need a ton of water to survive and things are only going to get hotter, drier as we move through climate change. Um, through climate change. And additionally, birds rely on the insects who rely on the plants. They've all evolved together. So there's a study from the Smithsonian that showed exotic um, like landscaping plants 
had, were a virtual food desert for um, birds and they really didn't have very many um, insects in them. So if you really wanna support plants, go check out one of the local nurseries we've got around town. They're really great resources. Um, Audubon also has an online plant database and a lot of super great resources um, on plants for birds. And I think Amy's dropping it in the chat if you wanna check that out later. Um, but yeah, you can see happy little bush tit right there in a chamisa. I know chamisa gets a bad rap for being kind of stinky, but they're super important for pollinators and our native bird species. All right, so just to recap, some birding tips from Katie. One, make sure you practice. The more you practice, the better you will get and the more familiar you will get. Things take time, so don't get frustrated. Remember to look for patterns and where the colors are on a body. Where is the blue? Where is the yellow? It's not just everywhere. Also remember, thinking about shape, and that'll come with time as you train your brain a little bit better. Um, looking at relative size of birds will get easier. Thinking about their behavior, you know, like that nuthatch has a super distinctive behavior of going down a trunk. No one else really does that. Um, and thinking about your habitat, you know, you're not going to have wading birds or ducks out in a savanna. So thinking about where you actually are, um, and that will also come with time as you become more familiar with your neighborhood. Um, use the tools that you have at your disposal, you know, field guides, apps, eBird. Um, it's great. They're all great. Um, and one of the best resources that might be a, hard, a little bit hard right now, but going out and learning with other birders is actually some of the best way to learn. I know right now we can't really be around each other so much, but there's some great Facebook groups um, that are really good for helping and supporting people as they learn. And then once things are a little bit safer for us all, we can um, potentially move it. You, you're all welcome to come up to the Randall Davy Audubon Center. We have free uh, Saturday bird walks that are led by some of our awesome volunteers who've been birding for decades. They're really fun um, and it's a really good way to learn um, those are still canceled for the moment, but if you follow us um, on our newsletter or social media, you'll get alerted when we start doing them again. And just a real quick plug for how to help your birds at home, plant your native plants, try to create habitat in your backyard. Birds like messy yards, we mentioned water, putting up nest boxes, all of those great are great ways to attract birds to your yard by supporting them and giving them good habitat. Um, it's always good to think about protecting your windows if you're trying to watch through them. So there's some good resources online if you look for bird safe windows or bird safe glass. Quick plug to just keep your cats inside or on a leash if they're outside. Um, cats, domestic and feral, are, are predators and so they're really hard for birds to compete with. And then the last thing is, um, you know, support conservation organizations and policies at a local, state, and federal level. Um, can be whatever organization you want. Audubon New Mexico is my favorite. Um, so you can support us by participating, signing up for our newsletter, um, or if you are able to give us a donation, help support our work um, and really makes us accessible to different parts of the community and allows us to do the good work out in the world and across the state. <sighs> so it's a lot of talking. I'm a little tired. You might be a little overwhelmed by all those birds. I just threw at you really fast. We're going to do maybe a couple minutes of questions and answer. Um, I have Amy, who's our avian biologist and a bigger bird nerd than I am, who's been monitoring the chat. So if you have a question for me or her, you can type it in there. Do we have some questions, Amy? Can you guys hear me? Okay, yeah, I do have a couple questions um, that people have been posting in the chat box. So thanks, Katie, that was awesome. Um, I don't think we'll have time to get to all the questions because we have quite a few, but um, I'll field some to Katie that are kind of relevant and um, something that people are interested in. So this is a pretty good question, right? actually. Does the boom in moth populations this spring affect the bird population? Does, um. I don't know that that's probably a long-term impact, you know, but we definitely see with bird populations, you know, uh, populations follow the prey, right? So I know that there's a lot of very fat and happy birds around my neighborhood right now. Um, so that might be able to support more nests and clutches this year. 
but we're also simultaneously competing with a very dry year with water and rain. So it's hard to say, and we might not know the impact of that, you know, for a couple of years until we've got data on it, but maybe. <laughs> Cool, thanks. Um, so we had a couple of questions about putting out water features for birds and specifically what's the best way to care for your water feature or keep it clean. And I can kind of add on to that question by saying, can you just talk generally about best practices for keeping your bird feeders and water features clean? Yeah, um, I think, you know, for water features, personally, just having the water moving and not stagnant because, you know, we all know that if you've got a bucket of water out there, it's going to get real gross real fast, um, stuff's gonna get caught on it. So if you have the ability to have um, like a little fountain or a pump or something that, but I know that's a little bit hard. So keeping an eye on it, um, making sure it's full because the sun here is real strong. So it evaporates real quick. But as stuff gets kind of, um, kind of grody in there, just cleaning it out every couple of weeks. Same thing goes with your bird feeders, which we don't often think about, but you know, those are essentially bird buffets. So we gotta make sure that we're keeping an eye on them wiping them down with maybe like a light vinegar solution, light soap solution if they get really gross, rinsing them out, especially our hummingbird feeders, because that's just like sugar water growing bacteria in it. So if it's been there for a few weeks and you see some floaties in there, you should throw that out, rinse it out with hot water and vinegar um, and refill it. Make sure they're going, that liquid is moving. And there's all that tips um, are available online as well. Cool, thanks. Um, so we have a couple questions about birdhouses and bird boxes. So um, what is a good way to figure out where to put a bird box and how do we know that a bird box is safe like it wasn't painted with any sort of toxic paint or what's just what's the best way to pick out a bird house and install it correctly to attract the birds that you want? Yeah, so I would say that probably the first thing you need to do is know what birds might use that, right? So um, different bird, size birds need different shapes and size boxes. So coming, figuring out first what birds use your yard is the first one. And then the second one is once you figure out, do I have blue birds, do I have robins, do I have other birds? Um, you can go online and a lot of that, those specs are available. Um, it's generally good to use you know, non-toxic paint and things like that. Um, and if you wanna build your own, it's easy to get you know, like kind of untreated wood or um, also going to talk to the folks at Wild Birds Unlimited. They're really great resources for those sorts of things. I know we have a really fabulous store in Santa Fe. Not sure what their status is right now with kind of closures and things, but they've been a really good resource for a lot of folks. Well, unfortunately, I don't think we have time for any more questions, um, but that was great, Katie. You got a lot of good feedback and cool questions, so um, I'm just going to turn it over to Desiree. And Thank you, Katie. Yeah, thanks Katie and Amy. I'm seeing some comments on our Facebook Live too that are sh I'm sharing lots of thanks um, and we appreciate that. So um, we have some additional webinars coming up um, where you're going to get a chance to hear Amy Erickson speak who um, was answering some of your questions on the birds and habitat of the Rio Grande. Keep out for the invitation to that in your um, inbox. The event is also on Facebook. And then if you've been really politically activated recently, um, Judy um, Kalman, our policy director, will give you a great overview of how to advocate for birds, wildlife, and people in New Mexico. So um, stay tuned for that. And if you um, want to view this recording again, um, you can um, check it out, out on our Facebook page. It'll be on Facebook Live and we will also upload it to YouTube. So again, thanks so much for attending and um, be sure to take this exit survey that will pop up once you close your screen. All right, and with that, we're gonna head out. Thanks again, all.